Chris, can you hear me? Sorry, Will, did you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Just making sure audio is coming in all right. Yep, all good. I'll, I'll just be here. I'll probably right, turn off, good. but I'm, I'm around, okay? Okay.
All right, hello everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. If you can't, please let me know in the chat um, and we will begin shortly. Awesome, thank y'all. All right, uh, my name is Will. I'm a PhD student at the University of Michigan and today I'm going to be presenting uh, Introduction to Pulse Processing. So to start off, Let's do a little recap, breaking down radiation detection. So as we've been discussing through all of this lecture series, we're looking at ionizing radiation and specifically the four main particle types that we look at are alpha particles, beta particles, photons, and neutrons. Specifically, our group focuses on photon and neutron detection, largely because those are the most penetrating particles such that they can escape sources very easily and travel significant distances and then interact with our detectors where the detectors range from anything that can give us information about the radiation that interacted with it. So we've been discussing a lot about scintillators, but we've also been talking about gaseous detectors. Scintillators, of course, give off photons. Gaseous detectors generally can give off photons in the uh, helium-4 that we looked at, but they also can give off um, uh, electron-ion pairs that are, then induce a charge that we then collect. But you also have things like calorimeters, and other types of detectors. We then take those information carriers and we get some kind of generalized response. This is either an analog or digital response or, and is generally in the form of a pulse or waveform that we call. We then take those waveforms and we analyze them to get uh, different spectroscopic information or particle information or something to give us information about what or how something interacted with our detector. So for today's lecture, we're going to focus largely on the response and we're going to start off by looking at where we get these pulses from and how we get these distinct shapes of pulses. So we're going to look at specifically uh, scintillator pulses. So if you think about um, a scintillator, you've got two, a scintillator coupled to, in this case, a photomultiplier tube, you've got two main uh, portions of it. You have the scintillator that it has some inherent decay based off of the, um, based off of its response. And then you have, you can model um, a photomultiplier tube very simply by an RC circuit. So our net output current is largely actually based off of the scintillator decay. The scintillator decay gives off photons. Those photons um, are collected, interact with the photocathode, and then are amplified uh, to give us some output current. And we define some total charge generated for this. But we can see that our output current, uh, oh, look, that goes like that. Uh, output current is defined here. We then know that this is our current and we will have some current across our capacitor and our, across our resistor. And we can look up what is the current across those two components. And then we can start rearranging everything and we see that we've got a first order differential equation. We can then solve to figure out our output voltage as a function of, in this case, the circuit that we have on detect and our detector response as a function of time. Um, so what does that look like? So let's take this and let's apply it to um, some real data. So imagine that we've got this same uh, simplified setup where we've got a 1.2 MeV uh, gamma ray interact with a sodium iodide detector. Sodium iodide yields about 38,000 photons per MeV and has a decay time of 0.23 nan microseconds. Uh, something to note that the decay constant is the inverse of the decay time. So just something to note. So with this interaction, we get just about 40,000 uh, photons. Of those 40,000 photons, about 70% of them actually make it to the photocathode, they're collected. And of those 70% that make it to the photocathode, we've got about a 20% efficiency for that. So multiply our number of photons by 0.7 and by 0.2. We then see that our gain, so our amplification across the photomultiplier tube is 10 to the fifth. Thus, we can take our 40,000, multiply by 0.7, by 0.2, by 10 to the fifth, and then we multiply by the fundamental charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs per electron, and we get a total charge generated 
for this given interaction. And then we can see this is just an example of something you might see where our RC circuit represented by the PMT is as a 100 kilo ohm resistant and then a 100 picofarad um, capacitance for it. So we can take all of these values, plug them into our equation, and solve it as a function of time. And we'll see something like this, where we get that rising edge of the pulse, and we'll talk about this more, and we also get this falling edge of the pulse. But this is a simplified model for our detector response uh, given this type of photomultiplier tube that has this approximate RC circuit uh, for this energy gamma ray. And now that we can kind of see uh, what our response is going to be, we can play around with the RC constant and also our uh, decay constant to see how these impact our pulses. So on the left here, I'm just showing um, where a lot of the rising edge comes from, and then on the right, where a significant portion of the uh, falling edge comes from. And of course, uh, the pulses that we see here are a convolution of our detector response, of our um, scintillator response, and our photomultiplier too. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, but we can adjust each of these parameters to kind of see how these pulses will be impacted by them. So on the left, you can see I've taken the uh, decay time of uh, sodium iodide here, and I've just uh, compared it with two other decay times, such that we can see that sodium iodide in blue gives, has the 0.23 microsecond um, decay time, versus if we increase that, we can see that slowly, um, or slowly our uh, rising edge uh, gets farther and farther. It takes more time to reach the peak amplitude. And there's also a decrease in amplitude uh, just by altering the decay time, which kind of makes sense that your light is uh, taking longer to be produced such that uh, the collection time for that and the net output time takes longer to do. Likewise, if we adjust our RC circuit here, so I've kept our capacitance at about 100, at, uh, 100 picofarads, but I'm adjusting the resistance for it, going from 100 kilo ohms, which we saw on the previous slide, down to 10 kilo ohms. And we can see that this greatly decreases the length of the pulse that we acquire. Now you might be wondering, uh, why don't we just want uh, very short pulses? Um, one of the trade-offs generally with this is that uh, you have a loss in energy resolution uh, when you go to very, very thin pulses uh, versus having larger pulses, you tend to be able to get better energy resolution. This is not always the case and is very detector dependent, uh, but that is something that you will occasionally see. So uh, these are all simulated uh, pulses based off of that voltage equation. So what do, um, so, so, ah, no. Uh, so these are all simulated pulses where we basically have every point across the pulse. However, in reality, what we do is we digitize these pulses. Um, so we do not have the complete makeup of the pulse. So you can see here on the left, I have this effectively continuous pulse. And on the right, you can see I've digitized it at a 2.5 megahertz digitization rate. So this is a point or an acquisition point every 0.4 microseconds. And you can see um, here we get a very well-defined idea of what our uh, rising edge of the pulse looks like and our falling edge of the pulse. Uh, you can see when we digitize it, in this case, however, we only have about three points making up the rising edge of our pulse. And we do have a lot of points in our tail um, or our falling edge but we have significant uncertainty in this rising edge. We also really only have this one point that gives us an idea of where the peak location is. So we probably also have relatively high uncertainty in this digitization, and we might want to consider a higher digitization rate for these types of pulses. Now, some, um, so to take a step back, really, what do I mean by digitization or digitizers? So digitizers sample an analog pulse and record the voltage values as a function of time. And they do this based off of some digitization rate. 
And this is how often the digitizer samples a pulse. So in this case, um, it could be 0.4 microseconds. Uh, we tend to use uh, higher uh, digitization rates because we work more with faster um, detector responses. So generally, we'll work with a 500 megahertz digitization rate, which is a digitized point every two nanoseconds. Um, digitizers also have three other um, parameters that I really want to talk about. The first is the dynamic range. And this is effectively how large a pulse can be accurately acquired. And we'll define what I mean by accurately later on. But uh, generally, this puts a cap on how large of a pulse can be acquired by a digitizer. And for instance, this can, uh, typical digitizers, you can have them have a dynamic range from zero to 0 0.5 volts um, or up to, uh, up to many volts in that case, up to like two or four volts. Um, the bit resolution is then how finely that dynamic range can be sampled. So for instance, um, we'll use 14-bit um, digitizers, which means in a two volt dynamic range, you can break up that two volt dynamic range into 16, 000, over 16,000 um, components effectively. So you break it up into those and it tells you how finely you can actually sample a pulse in a given dynamic range. And then the last portion is your data throughput. Uh, this is how many pulses the digitizer can actually handle. It can digitize and return to your acquisition system. This one can be very important, especially when dealing with a uh, high throughput or uh, very high um, activity sources and things of that nature. Now, of course, this is a digitization of our um, simulated pulse on the left. So what are some actual pulses? Uh, what do some actual digitized pulses look like? So here I've given uh, two examples of typical uh, pulses that you could uh, come across. So the first one, um, this is a naturally positive pulse with a long, deta long decay time. This is still being coupled to a J-series sensile silicon photomultiplier. And we can see uh, we do get a decent amount of points in the rising edge here. And then we very well acquire our falling edge. And uh, I've got, given another example. This is a Hamamatsu one-inch PMT uh, that we've also coupled um, a still beam crystal to. And we can see the time scale here. Uh, our digitization rate for both of these is two nanoseconds. So this is 1,000 nanoseconds, and this is 400 nanoseconds. So we can see that this pulse is maybe 50 nanoseconds wide, or this pulse is nearly 800 nanoseconds wide. So our Hamamatsu PMTs give off, in this case, much faster uh, responses then do our silicon photomultipliers. And that's generally because the capacitance, internal capacitance of SIPMs tends to be higher than PMTs. So interesting to note here, but you will see positive and negative pulses of varying sizes. Now, a couple of points to um, define in these pulses. Generally, you'll see um, what is referred to as the baseline. This is the area before the rising edge of the pulse. Um, again, uh, baseline in this case is inverted because this is a negative pulse uh, where we have a falling edge. Um, generally, you can uh, invert these to make them positive pulses, and we'll talk about that a, a bit later. And then we also have a falling edge um, with these. So I'm going to actually focus on the pulse on the left here to begin our data processing. So how do we actually extract information from these pulses? So the first thing we want to do is actually subtract our baseline. So we notice that this area is not at zero. Um, it's some level above zero. And we generally do this such that we allow for any variance in our detector response or for the digitizer, such that if there's um, different electronic noise or an issue with the electronics, that you have some variation or in your applied voltage that causes some variation in this baseline that you can still accurately acquire the waveforms for it. So if you notice, uh, so uh, to begin our pulse processing, the first thing we want to do is subtract this baseline. So to do that, we go right past the rising edge of the pulse, uh, generally a couple nanoseconds, 
um, or depending on your digitization rate, just a couple of digitized points past it and average an area around that. In this case, this is about 25 uh, digitized points there where we take an average value there and we subtract the entirety of the pulse um, from this average value. And then you can see now we have this point right around zero. And this does two things for us. One, it allows us to convert this pulse to voltage very easily. And then it also allows us to be able to pick off our uh, pulse amplitude and determine our pulse integral very easily. I'll talk about those in just a moment. So you can see we have our baseline subtracted pulse. Now you notice uh, here we have these units of digitizer units. And digitizer units aren't by themselves necessarily that useful. Uh, we want to be able to convert those to a standard uh, parameter, in this case, voltage. So to be able to do that, uh, we look at the dynamic range and then the uh, bit resolution of our detector. So in this case, our dynamic range is 2 volts and our bit resolution is 14. So to convert from digitized units, um, which is in units of bits, to voltage, we multiply by the dynamic range divided by the total number of bits, which is 2 to the 14th. And we can see that this pulse, which has just under 2,500 digitizer units, uh, turns out to be just under about 0.3 volts. And I think that's on the next slide as well. Yes. So uh, for this, we um, see that our pulse height in this case is about 0.289 volts, 0.29 volts roughly. Um, and this is just uh, determined by taking the maximum point um, of this pulse. And uh, in this case, since we've already baseline subtracted, just taking that maximum point. Now you can uh, notice that there's probably some variance in that max uh, pulse height. And that, uh, is impact, that impacts energy resolution, that kind of thing. But we take pulse height generally because it is proportional to the total light output. So it gives us an idea of what the energy deposition in a given interaction was. Uh, to collect the total light output response, we use pulse integral. So you can see here on the right where we have our digitized points and we've integrated these and we've used an approximate integrated method. So if we zoom in on this rising edge here, you can see what we've done is just assumed a rectangular integration. And this is relatively common uh, for doing this integration method because um, this simplifies it and is a good approximation for it. So we sum the area for each one of these bins going across this pulse, and we only do this for a defined region. So in this case, we go from 5% of the amplitude in the rising edge, which actually is the point before that, and then down to 1% of the amplitude in the falling edge, which you can see ends about right there. And the reason we want to only integrate where our pulse range really is, is so we don't add any noise or variance due to the baseline on either side of the pulse. Now, something to notice here um, that I'm not going to discuss uh, later on, but this is the same method that we use for pulse shape discrimination. So in this case, we're integrating the entirety of the pulse by summing each one of these approximate integral areas. Um, in pulse shape discrimination, we're only doing this for some total region of the pulse and then some tail region of the pulse. And, so, and taking the ratio of those to determine a pulse shape and be able to classify something as a uh, photon or neutron. Uh, for this though, uh, this gives us an approximation of the total light output of a given interaction. Now, if we remember from previous lectures, our energy resolution is statistically dependent. So depending on how many uh, information carriers we get will give us um, better or worse uh, energy resolution. So one of the uh, reasons for doing a pulse integration instead of just taking the pulse height is because you are getting better statistics across the pulse and you will end up getting better energy resolution. So for our sodium iodide detector, uh, which we'll typically use in the labs, getting a, using pulse height to determine our energy resolution, we'll get an energy resolution of about 8 to 10% versus if we use a pulse integral, we'll get a resolution around 
So it does make a uh, significant difference. Um, and just uh, some clarification, um, this is a definition of null that I think is worth uh, talking about uh, since it is um, brought up and I've been mentioning a lot. What do I mean by rising edge and falling edge? So rising edge and falling edge in this case are physical areas of the pulses, but they also have a definition when talking about instrumentation. Um, so the rising edge is the time it takes uh, the pulse to go from 10% of its amplitude to 90% of its amplitude. And the falling edge is the time from 90% down to 10% of the maximum. Now something to notice, um, because we have two kind of competing effects here. So if uh, we have some digitization uncertainty associated with this, and we have some natural variance uh, depending on our detector setup. So previously, it looked like um, our pulse height or our rise time um, for a given detector setup should be about constant. Uh, something to notice here is that there is some variance based off of the electronics, based off of the digitizer, things of that nature that will give you a spread in the rise time. So if we are to create a histogram of the rise time or rising edges um, for all of these pulses, you can see here, we get about an average of just under nine nanoseconds with a minor spread in that. Um, and this can be useful to look at to uh, ensure that you are accurately acquiring uh, and accurately digitizing your pulses because you can get uh, very interesting skews in these distributions if you are not actually, if you are not acquiring the rising edge with sufficient digitized points. And this also leads us into our next discussion, which is going into timing and timing of these pulses. So the initial method that was came up with time for uh, the timing or start time of the pulse is just to set a threshold. In this case, um, when the pulse crosses some threshold, um, then that is considered the start time of the pulse. And this was an analog system that was initially used, but it's still used in ASIC systems and FPGA systems today, so it might still be encountered. Where effectively, if you have some pulse where you have some baseline that goes up, and this, once it crosses this point, that is the trigger that says that is the start time of the pulse. And then you can uh, analyze and acquire the rest of the pulse. Um, you can see that this is very subject to noise of the pulse, but also amplitude of the pulse. So we know that uh, from this and from our previous voltage equations that uh, the rise time uh, should be independent of um, the amplitude of the pulse, that it should just be a constant, it should be constant as a function of amplitude. So in this method, because of that, we know that if we have a trigger level that is constant, that is just looking for some amplitude, but we have sufficient uh, differences in, in the amplitude of the pulses that we're acquiring, we'll have significant variance in our start time of those pulses, which needs to be taken into account, such that you can see here where we have um, one start time that is much earlier than the other, uh, simply because of the amplitude difference of these two pulses. Um, something to remember, a method to get around this that was developed is called constant fraction discrimination or constant fraction timing. So in this case, this was again another analog method uh, developed to determine the start time of the pulse, and this was specifically developed to be independent of the pulse amplitude. And this is a little more complex. Here, uh, I demonstrated it with digitized waveforms of course, this can, uh, was done with analog waveforms. So in orange here, you can see um, the original waveform that is in orange. So this is our acquired waveform. And we take this waveform and we break it up into two separate waveforms. One, we multiply by, like, by just some fraction f. Uh, this can range from 10% uh, to 30%, for instance. Uh, but it's generally a parameter that can be optimized. We then take this same pulse, delay it by several nanoseconds, and then invert it. We can then sum these two pulses together, and we get this bipolar uh, pulse here, where we define our start time based off of where this intercepts zero. Uh, 
Um, this is, again, a method uh, for uh, determining our start time. And the nice thing about this was that it is independent of pulse amplitude. Uh, so this was great for having that consistency in your detector. Of course, because we have uh, digitized waveforms and we're using digitized waveforms, uh, they came up with a simplistic method called digital constant fraction discrimination, which is uh, similar in that this uh, becomes independent of amplitude. So for this method, you can see we have some baseline, our rising edge, and then our falling edge. What we do is we figure out some fraction of the amplitude, in this case about 20%, for instance, and figure out where that uh, time is along the rising edge of the pulse. Um, and this then defines our start time. And to give you an idea, if we were to set up a coincident measurement, something with like sodium-22, sodium-22 is a positron emitter such that you get two 511 keV gamma rays back to back that are emitted in opposite direction. And if you set up your detector system, uh, opposite of each other, you can look for these coincidences and applying this method, you can get a time difference histogram, something like this. Um, one of the nice things about this method is it's very easy to optimize um, these parameters such that we can look at the width or standard deviation of this distribution as a function of this applied uh, fraction and optimize our detector performance um, for time resolution, for instance. So these were a couple methods for timing. The last couple things I want to talk about um, for pulses is pulse cleaning. So generally, um, a combination of noise, additional particle interactions, and digitizer limits can contribute to the generation of pulses uh, that are not necessarily useful for analysis. There are definitely uh, methods, and I think you'll hear about um, some pulse recovery uh, methods uh, later on uh, when we talk about neural networks, but generally uh, that's rather difficult and time consuming to do. So uh, we want to not necessarily uh, use those pulses or have those pulses impact our data analysis. Um, but the problem is we have to find those pulses uh, that are not necessarily useful for our analysis. So for um, here, I've given two uh, data sets to look at. The first one we can see, um, we get what is called a clipped pulse. So this is a pulse that has reached the dynamic range of our detector such that we're not actually acquiring the totality of the top of the pulse. We can also see that there's some interesting uh, reflectance in this pulse um, such that we have some level of noise in it that also may not be uh, useful for us. Uh, in these pulses, you can see these are, um, we have significant pulse pileup or double pulses where we have multiple interactions occurring in the same detector setup or in the same detector in the same acquisition window. So the question is, what are some methods that we can use to um, clean these pulses? The easiest one to do for um, clip pulses is we just look at, do we have this constant value multiple times in our digitized uh, samples? Um, if the answer is yes, then we know that's a clipped pulse. If the answer is no, then we might have to do um, some more creative analysis. And one of the uh, more uh, in-depth methods used to do this um, is template matching. So what you can do is you can average pulses uh, from a clean data set uh, to develop as a function of energy or light output uh, to develop uh, an average pulse and standard deviation of that average pulse. So you can see I have that here for two light output ranges. So the first one, 25 to 50 keVe, and the second one, 275 to 300 keVe, where we have the uh, average digitized value in dark blue there, and then we have a one standard deviation uncertainty band around that. And we can see that uh, the reason for making this a function of light output or energy is because that the uncertainty for these does significantly vary with light output and uncertainty. Uh, just visually, you can see that between these two distributions. We can also see that there is a little bit of a shape change between the two as well. 
Now what we do is we take this template, which is this average, and we set some standard deviation uh, threshold such that if we find that any digitized point in our acquired waveform, let's say it goes outside of three standard deviations, then we classify that as a bad pulse or a pulse we want to remove. And for an example, you can see I have overlaid a measured pulse here with the template and standard deviation. And this pulse was interesting in that out um, towards the tail of the pulse, we just got this two blips of noise um, in the pulse. Um, in this case, uh, depending on how you want to define a bad pulse, we could only look, let's say, from 50 digitized points to about 125, depending on how complicated we wanted to make this. Uh, but in this case, if we're looking at the whole waveform, we would probably end up removing this pulse. Now, if we go back uh, to the double pulses, uh, we can now apply this method to those pulses, and we can see that we can really clean them up. So applying template matching can effectively clean your data sets. It's very good at finding double pulses. It's very good at finding noise in your pulses. Uh, the major issue with it is it's computationally intensive because you're taking every acquired pulse you have, normalizing it, and then looking at um, a lookup table, taking a difference and figuring out the standard deviations of all of the, or how many standard deviations away each one of those differences is. So this can be complicated and computationally intensive. However, it does work very well in that you can acquire some clean data. So we can see here we had about, um, in this case, 18 pulses uh, that were double pulses. And applying this method, clean them out such that we know that we have 19 good pulses that we know these are, in this case, classified as neutrons. A less intensive manner um, to clean data sets is uh, via pulse height method. So this is less computationally intensive, but um, is not as rigorous. So in this method, what you can do is, since we know uh, our rising edge and our falling edge, we know the regions that largely we care about um, for analysis. So we can define, let's say, uh, starting at 75 digitizer units to um, the rest of the pulse, if we have a, pul a pulse height value or a max value in that range that is above some threshold, we assume that's a double pulse and then that pulse can be removed. Um, the same thing with the baseline in front in that area, you can do that as well. Excuse me. But in this case, we do not see any uh, double pulses there. This takes down the computational intensity of your analysis uh, greatly since you're just looking for a maximum point above some threshold in a given region of your pulse. That doesn't mean, however, that let's say we have this red blip here and we have a very intense red pulse. That means that this point may not actually be um, acquired and that double pulse might actually get it through. So you really have to tune this method to the data set and how you want to go about cleaning your data things like that to consider. Um, and with that, actually, we've discussed uh, how to go about uh, determining, how to go about pre-processing our data, uh, converting our pulses into voltage, acquiring uh, pulse height, pulse integral, some timing methods, and then some pulse cleaning methods. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, so first question from Marcus, is there a possibility to have baseline drift during the measurement? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, how would you interpret the signal in that case? Uh, in that case, uh, because we're digitizing all of our points uh, and we're always determining our uh, pulse height and pulse integral relative to a subtracted baseline, uh, because we're accounting for any change in that baseline on a per pulse uh, basis, a uh, shift in the baseline doesn't necessarily impact us. However, generally, if you have shift in the baseline, you probably have other uh, shifts in your electronics, 
So if you do see something like that, you definitely want to check calibration points and things like that to ensure that you're also accounting for any overall gain shift in your detector response. Awesome, no problem. Uh, uh, what causes the double pulse measurements? Uh, good question, Stephanie. So in this case, um, and Chris will be talking about this in later slides, uh, these were detector responses in our um, accelerator beam line, uh, such that uh, when our beam is active, our detectors get hit with a very, very intense um, pulse, uh, very intense number of pulses. Um, something to note um, as well, and you can go into this in null, uh, the most probable time for having a, an additional interaction in your detector is immediately after another interaction. So in very high fields, you'll see that uh, when we get uh, a, a pulse acquisition, you will get lots of pulses uh, past that. So it just so happened that this data set from, was from a very high um, active background uh, due to our accelerator being on. Uh, good question. Uh, from Ila, could you please talk about the most common programming languages you are using for cleaning the data? Ah, absolutely. I highly recommend Python. Python is fantastic for doing this analysis. I know a lot of people also work in MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB, however, you need to, um, the licensing, um, and it is very nice if you have the licensing. However, um, Python uh, is free, open source availability. There are some great libraries for it. I'm very biased in that I'm going to tell you um, Python. Python's fantastic. That is what I program in, but I know a lot of people also use MATLAB for this. I think um, a boss who is also in our group also likes uh, C++. So whatever programming language you're comfortable in, you can generally figure out how to do this kind of stuff with. Um, most of the background for them, you will get uh, some benefit in speed uh, with using uh, C++, I believe. But I think uh, Python, uh, the version 3.0 and greater is all background C. So you shouldn't really see that much of a difference in processing time and things like that. Uh, when you want to upgrade to high-speed, high-volume processing, you'll want to consider NCC, OpenMP with GCC, much narrative. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, any reason for not using trapezoidal integration? Is it just as simple as the rectangular method? Uh, probably. Uh, rectangular method has been is just very commonly applied, so that's what we've been going with. Uh, I have not seen a comparison to know if there is a significant benefit of using a trapezoidal method versus a um, just rectangular integration. There probably is some, um, but that's something that it should definitely, I, I would be very surprised if that had not been looked into already, um, but that's a very good question and something I will definitely double check on. All right, with that, um, I'll hang out for a couple more minutes if there are any more questions, but thank you all for coming.